So this is uh, episode two of I'm in a car. Um, I got Evan McKinnon here with me. Say hi, Evan. Hi, Evan. <laughs> Good uh, afternoon. Maybe we can start with just a, a little kind of intro, kind of uh, you know who you are, where you kind of came from, what you've been up to, and kind of what you're up to these days. Okay. Um, who I am? Evan McKinnon. Currently, uh, president and CEO of McKinnon Transport in Guelph. Uh, we are in. 88-year-old family-operated trucking business. I'm third generation, and the, uh, the fourth generation is there right now as we speak, actively trying to make a living while I'm driving in a car. Um, <laughs> yeah, where'd I come from? Came from Caledon originally, moved to Guelph in 1960 when our business moved here. And uh, I've been in the trucking business since I could walk, and uh, that's what I do. We've uh, been for we moved to Guelph because of our, our major account was in Guelph. And we're now an international company, but uh, we have family roots in Guelph, so Guelph's continued to be our home for our business, and uh, it's a great community. Beautiful. Okay, that's what great. What am I up to today? Yeah, what do you have to these days? What am I up to these days? Uh, I'm hoping to work a little less. Uh, like I said, my son's doing a great job of. Uh, running the day-to-day -day business, and uh, I'm going to have some spare time on my hands, so I'm uh, young at heart, so I'm still enjoying uh, a few uh, hobbies and things like that that I like to do, and uh, I'm going to spend a little time down south, see more United States from a motorcycle, hopefully in the uh, very near future. Beautiful. Yeah. When was the last time you had spare time in your life? <laughs> I've not had a lot of spare time in my life. I've That's been a, what I, I was a workaholic most of my life. And, uh, yeah, I was raised in a workaholic environment, and I adapted that myself. And uh, you know what? It worked at the time. I thought it worked because we made good money, and it was profitable. Why not? But uh, I've since learned there's a, there's a better way to go through life with a bit of a balance. So, um no, I've not had a lot of spare time in my life. Maybe, you know, this is just something I'm kind of getting used to in the last year or so. As, uh, like I said, as my family's grown and they've taken on more responsibility at work. So, uh, yeah, it's it's kind of new to me to have spare time. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to hearing about what you do with it. I'm, yeah. I'm happy for you. It's yeah, great. You. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's exciting. So I, I had the privilege of listening to a talk that you did at Lakeside Church. Seth shared it with me. Okay. And uh, I, I thought it was great. I think you, you connected with the crowd in a big way. Um, kind of one of the biggest things that I got from it was really, I guess there's two ideas. The first idea was around the family curse. Yes. And, and kind of, you know, because of where we grow up, yeah. we might have certain tendencies because we've been around it for so long. We kind of get indoctrinated. Right. But we don't have to be a victim of that. Correct. We can make a decision to get out of it. And I'd love Correct. to learn a bit more about that. And then the right. second piece is around, you know, um, we have the ability to write our next chapter or last chapter. Correct. Um, and okay. I was just curious what that perspective is all about and where it came from and, and how it's impacting, you know, you and say your son yeah. family today. So on your first question, um, I refer to it as a generational curse. And there's a lot of people, myself probably included, who maybe have adopted certain lifestyles based on what previous generations did, based on the environment we grew up in, the environment we worked in. Maybe, you know, we're, we could be the third or fourth generation to have adopted a particular habit. Typically, they're not good habits. If they were good habits, we wouldn't call them a curse. <laughs> but, um, you know, they could be anything from drinking activity, uh, they could be overweight, it could be, in my case, it was workaholic. I'm a third generation workaholic in a family business that was quite successful. And, uh, you know, it's quite easy to say, well, I do it that way, but so did my dad, so did his dad. And I believe we have the privilege to change and eliminate that family curse and make a difference for the next generation. So. And sometimes that's what we're doing it for, whether it's for ourselves or for the next generation. Because, the, you know, my children, all three of my children work in the industry. Two of them work for us. and uh, But all three of them have a healthy balance between their life and their work. Their family benefits from uh, a healthy benefit, that, that a healthy lifestyle they have. And, uh, you know, my 
family. I, I missed most of my children growing up. Fortunately, today I have a fantastic relationship with them. But at the time, you know, I was busy working. That was my goal when I was young. And that's part of my generation too. But we have the privilege, I think, to break those family curses. Whether it's, uh, like I said, could be due. You know, I'm overweight and so is every generation of my family. So what the heck. Well, if we don't break those curses, our children are going to be saying the same thing in 20 years from now about about their curse so yeah and so I that's kind of what i meant by that and which is cool and I, I found a lot in in my you know experience anyway and um some people aren't necessarily aware of what a generational curse might look like or, or even if there is one impacting them that's i right. find a lot of times people kind of wake up and take their day on you know or take their life on one day at a time um not necessarily yep. conscious of what's happening to them or around them and why it's happening. Yeah, because that's where they grew up. So I'm, I'm curious know, that's then. the way things were around the household. For you, how did you go about, A, realizing it, becoming conscious of it, and then B, changing it? Oh, good question. Um, you know what? I changed my lifestyle quite a bit close to 20 years ago. And at that time, I started appreciating a few other things in life. And I realized, because up till my mid-40s, early 40s, I was, I worked every Saturday and most Sundays till noon, you know. And uh, not until I kind of changed my lifestyle did someone say to me, like, is it really necessary, you know. And I started doing things with friends and that on weekends. And then I realized, you know, work didn't suffer. In fact, work almost benefited because now some other people had the chance to spread their wings, you know, where I was interfering before. So when I started changing those habits, there was immediate results that that were positive. So uh, I guess that's one of the things I did in that aspect. And then uh, your other question about writing the last chapter, um, in my particular case, my lifestyle wasn't very healthy up until my early 40s, and I didn't know there was any other way to live, and uh, I have an addictive personality, so uh, more is better. The word moderation doesn't even exist in my vocabulary. I still struggle with that, but... I was going to say, I, you do have an addictive personality. I love being around you. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I don't know that it means my personality is addictive, <laughs> but it means all the aspects of addiction are in my personality, which, you know, I'm an egomaniac with an inferiority complex. That's great. In other words, I'm not much, but I'm all I think about, you know. So, anyhow, um, we have the privilege, and mine's partially spiritual too, you know, I have, I'm fortunate that I have God in my life today, which I didn't have before, and I've had a an awakening in that area and I realized that uh, just again it's almost like this generational curse again just because the first 40 years of our life was lived a certain way doesn't mean we're destined to uh, finish it off we can have the privilege of making some changes you know it, it takes a little bit of work and you got to be conscious of it and it changes how you think and how you feel about things but there's benefits if there wasn't benefits then there would be nothing to celebrate at the end and uh but like any change we make, we have to first identify the change needs to be made. And uh, sometimes that can bring a little shame into the picture because we identify that something's wrong with us. You know? So rather than focus on the shame, just focus on the benefits that are available when we make those changes. So, uh, you know, I've changed my lifestyle. I've everything from whether it's working out or eating habits. I still haven't kicked the bad habit of smoking. But other than that, I'm doing a fairly healthy lifestyle, which I never did earlier in my life, you know. And uh, I had the privilege of uh, turning 64 weeks ago. Happy know? belated. So, thank you. You're welcome. So that wasn't, uh, when I was in my early 40s, I didn't expect to see that age. So today that's quite a benefit that, uh, you know, I can appreciate one of the rewards from me making changes and rewriting the last chapter of my life is that it doesn't have to end the way I thought it was going to end. That's super cool. So that's kind so, of what that's about. How did you identify that though? What was the catalyst? Because I, I find this happened so much and I, and I don't want to let you off the hook because yeah, I, can I, see think, that. I think there's something <laughs> kind of neat in this idea. I think a lot of people can get a lot of benefit from in terms of, you know, understanding and becoming conscious of that change. Like, you know, for me, I've got a amazing team of people all around me that essentially shoot me straight most of the time yep. and 
give me feedback on, you know, how to make myself grow. And I, I've said it time and time again, I'll say it right now, you know, I, I'm, I'm always grateful. I journal on a regular basis. And, and one of the things I'm always grateful for is the team I work with every day because they help me be a better mm-hmm. me. But not everybody has that. And maybe you had it. I'm not sure what it was. And maybe it is just about surrounding yourself with people that will shoot you straight. But what was it that made you come become conscious that, well, A, the way you're living isn't going to be suitable for the way, for your life, and B, you can make that change. What was it that hit you? So, for me, what a long question. For me, it was uh, identifying and being taught that, first of all, I had addictive behavior, which is a very self-centered aspect. It's very, I'm a control enthusiast, so I like to try to plan and control how things are going to be done in an anticipation that I had some control over the outcome, which I don't. Um, so, first of all, I had to learn that I wasn't in control, and then I had to become teachable. You know? and, and obviously, from the way you talk, and I see it around your office as well, um, you're fortunate at a much younger age to be aware that you are teachable and you can learn from other people. When you're a control enthusiast, it's pretty hard to adopt to that. And I struggled with that, you know, because I always thought I knew the better way to do everything right. So I had to first identify that uh, I have an issue with control and with my type of personality and that uh, other people's opinions really do matter and other people's advice whether I liked hearing it or not, it was very loving and caring, and the people, they had my best interests at heart, and once I realized that, I can learn from them, so, uh, so I, I had to become teachable. Yeah, that's cool, and I think that's, you know, kind of one last question on this piece, and then we'll move on to some other line of questioning, because I've got some Good. other things. Um, how do you distinguish what feedback to listen to, and what to ignore? Because I know there's a lot of people around me that have a lot of opinions, some of which, and all with this mindset of they're here to serve and help, but some of it I don't want to listen to, and some of it I know I should listen to. And what have you done to try to make the decision between which ones you should ignore and listen to? Well, um, I've almost gone in the other direction. When I first started listening to people, I was a little selective on who I listened to. I listened to people who I had a desire to be more like them. People who seemed to have peace and calm in their life. People who had a great spiritual relationship. People who had been very successful in work. Those are still all people that I want to listen to and pay attention to. But um, I've since learned that uh, when God has a message to deliver to me, it's not up to Evan to choose who he's going to use as a vessel to deliver that message to me. And he's picked some real characters to deliver a message to me sometimes. <laughs> People that you might not think you should be listening to. But it's amazing. So, actually, today, I listen to more people than I used to because I now realize it's, it's not up to me to choose who the message is coming from. As far as feedback about things Evan can improve, as I've opened up, I've developed a very pretty good group of core friends that love me to pieces and I absolutely trust the advice they give me so uh, I rely on people who share common values and common ethics with me and people who have already proven to me they have my best interest at heart and uh, yeah sometimes it's hard to decipher if the advice is loving or is it being critical I guess Right, and you got to kind of decipher on your which is which. Yeah, it really starts with too like surrounding yourself with people that you know really do care about you. Yeah, and it was there was a really cool thing I read a, a couple of days ago it was uh, be careful uh, of taking advice from somebody you wouldn't want to switch places with. That's a good way of putting it. I like that. Yeah, it's, it's very good. Thank you. Well, thank you for doing this. I'm going to take a pause, and then I'm going to come right back. So okay. thank you for doing this, Evan. Perfect. And uh, being part My of our, our second episode <laughs> of I Am In A Car.